We appreciate your taking time out of your busy schedule to share some comments with us. And so I don't want to waste any more time. And uh, let's move into a few questions uh, that uh, we'd like to share with the audience. And, you know, first of all, could you share with us some of the magnificent planning that we saw that went into this master plan for Irvine? Could you tell us what the primary focus of the company's business plan was mm -hmm. going back into those uh, early days? Was it primarily or solely residential, or did you quickly expand into commercial mm -hmm. and mixed use? Stan, you've asked me a number of questions there. And first of all, I'd like to say to you that I respect you. You're an incredible talent. You and I have worked together for the last 34, 35 years, and I have great respect for you, and thank you for that. Thank you. Um, you've asked me several questions there, and let me try to answer you on, on that. I think first you have to go to, before the master plan, you have to go to the land. The land, and it's about location, location, and location. I believe everyone in this room understands that. And particularly a location that is on the Southern California coast with the beach at one side and the mountains 22 miles inland um, located equidistance between Los Angeles and San Diego and the market forces uh, that come to bear from both of those metropolitan areas that's an incredible start for a master plan. As far as the plan is concerned, we, we talked about William Pereira and his vision. And it was, his vision was to create something out of an idea in his mind. I knew him. He was an extraordinary thinker and an extraordinary designer. He wanted to create a place that was a city that was self-governed and was economically self-sufficient. The primary businesses of the company in the early days, it's interesting at the beginning, in the 1960s and even into the 1970s, the businesses were agriculture and farming with some small scale home building going on in the periphery of the ranch since there was five, six incorporated cities uh, around on the periphery of the ranch, those cities uh, took in the home builders and, uh, and made the new tracks, the new home building uh, communities a part of their city. The, I think this, what we have here is um, the greatest opportunity in the world for professional planners, master builders. It combines the disciplines of art, architecture, and all the disciplines that, that are necessary to bring about a, uh, a new community. The master planning is comprehensive and fundamental to the plan was a balance between, as far as Pereira was concerned, the balance between residential, industrial, office, retail, and open space. Pereira wanted to create a city that had a sense of place, that a place where families could live, work, and play. He estimated the population for the city of Irvine to grow to over 300,000. It currently is around 230, 235,000. Jobs were important, were really important to bring as part of the balance. And Pereira focused on that. Today, we have 230,000 residents, and we have 300,000 jobs. So 
the balance isn't quite right. We're overbalanced with jobs today, but that's okay. It'll balance out uh, in the end. The master plan as Pereira envisioned it. Given the scale of this land, he envisioned the plan to be alive and never stop. And that has been a significant undertaking for our planning group within the company who works with outside consultants also. But our group of planners, landscape architects and architects, work daily with the master plan. And as I said, it's ever moving. It's alive. And maybe the most important part of the plan at the end of the day here is, is the village concept. The residential development, it's not tract housing. It's village housing, it's village living. And it includes the schools, which is a very important part of Irvine, the parks and the shopping centers nearby, all connected by a path. You heard Ray Watson talk about a necklace. There are many necklaces here in this planning process and many paths, walking paths, vehicular paths, and that was all part of William Pereira's idea. And in the end, he felt the most important part was that the residents who live there, who work there, would have community pride, and I believe they do. Thank you. That's, that's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, answer, and I know you focus on the plan and the design. Yeah, as you know, uh, I'm an accountant. Accountants, we look at numbers. Uh, we don't get overexcited with master plans and designs and architect. Uh, that's not what we do. We're scorekeepers. That's what I do in my life. So let me ask the hard question. So the real question in my mind is, why has the Irvine Company been so successful and had such a great scorecard when other large master plan communities have labored and or actually failed? What's the difference? Stan, as I said before, the success, a great deal of it has to do with the location, location and location. And beyond that, as we heard earlier, the corporation, the Irvine Corporation, goes way back. In fact, it's had a, it was one of the five first incorporations in the state of California in 1894. And it, the, the company has had an outside board of directors, a corporate governance that meets on a regular basis and that provides a discipline in, in the decision making. That brings a lot of comfort, it brings direction to the company, and brings a lot of comfort to financial institutions. It also, the board has been very careful to avoid any short-term decisions. Their decision in 1960 was to adopt the master plan, was to grant the land to the 1,000 acres to the University of California, Irvine, and create the, uh, the open space. For a person like yourself, and you call yourself a bean counter sometimes, for you, Stan, you understand this. There was no mortgage financing on the land. The land was free, it was clear, and time was our friend. It was not our enemy. We, with the time, we had the ability to understand, to research, and to create the plan, to move the plan along. And that's a, a, a very important part uh, of this. In the early days, and by the way, I'll just say, that the company has been a private company for all these years. 
there was one point that we took a segment or a group of the company, the apartment group, public for five years. That was an interesting opportunity, but I, have, I am convinced that community development, large-scale community development, has to be done in a, uh, in a private environment, meaning that there are no quarterly dividends required. The cash is reinvested. The cash is reinvested into the planning, into the infrastructure, into the um, asset portfolio of office, retail, industrial, and apartment uh, properties. The business strategy, Stan, in the early days um, was very simple. The cash that was generated by the company, by the farming opportunities, the ranching opportunities, the Valencia orange, orange groves. The company was the largest Valencia orange grower in the United States. It was a big business in those days. Good oranges, too. Good oranges. And, and that cash flow from farming and ranching uh, supported the master planning and it uh, supported the operating costs uh, and the taxes. So uh, time was our friend, and along uh, beyond that, the early residential land sales to independent home builders on the periphery of the ranch uh, created additional cash flow for expansion, expansion meaning infrastructure expansion and creating the the new villages. You've asked me a question before, and that is, why haven't the other developers, the other builders of, of large size master plan communities, why have they had problems? Some have been successful, many have not. I believe it all comes down <clears throat> to acquisition funding, land debt. And because of that, because of the interest um, requirement, interest payment, there was very little patience to do the planning properly and, and move the uh, new community along at a proper pace. Some of the sponsors were public and they did have quarterly earning expectations. And that's tough, that's difficult when you're developing a large scale master plan. Many of them, in my opinion, and I've talked to many and I've, several of them are represented here today, like Columbia, Maryland. Columbia, Maryland did a, uh, Columbia did a, it was, it was a fantastic uh, project by the Rouse Company. As time went on, my observation is that the shopping centers that Rouse created around the United States really carried the day uh, for them. And it wasn't the, um, the master plan community that added to their earnings. Reston, Virginia, in the end, was an orderly liquidation. New Hall Land and Farm Company, you probably read the other day, they're still having trouble with their entitlement to use. And uh, Redwood Shores in Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area, owned by Mobile Oil, they have stopped their development, or I should say their development was stopped by uh, environmental process and has not uh, moved forward. So um, there's more to learn from what's going on uh, in America, but um, with, with, with community development. Um, it's a business that requires a great deal of patience. And capital, I presume. Pardon me? And capital. And capital, yes, sir. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that uh, response. Uh, <laughs> what, what, do, what do you really think? Can, can Irvine be duplicated elsewhere in the future? 
I've had that question many times, Dan, and I come back to location, location, and location. <laughs> it's that simple. How do you find 93,000 acres of land on the Pacific coast with a Mediterranean climate between two metro, with, with the market forces of two metropolitan areas? I think that's very difficult to find. And second, and maybe this is even more important, the government regulatory and environmental restrictions have become so overwhelming for large-scale projects that they are not feasible going forward, in my opinion. There's little opportunity to problem solve and get on with the business of new development. Government regulatory and environmental restrictions at the local, regional, state, and federal level are just overwhelming. Not to mention the numerous legal challenges that follow. There is not time to resolve those issues. That takes an extensive uh, amount of time. And so I'm not sure that major community development, as we're talking about today, is a predictable business proposition. Stan, let me just share with you. We counted this up a year or so ago. The company had the pleasure of doing business with 143 different municipalities, different government agencies. The best one, maybe I need a drink for this one, <laughs> was a small quasi-municipal um, um, agency. It was a water and sewer district called the Santiago Water District, made up of old-time landowners and some local politicians. They control the water and sewer for a portion of our ranch. It's interesting how they met. I went to one of the meetings. They met in the back of a bar, and the meeting was about 20 minutes long, and they talked about their farming and ranching products and then went back to the bar. So it was very difficult to get business done there. Beyond that, what we found over the years, we've dealt with kangaroo rats, the preservation of coastal sagebrush that cowboys and farmers, ranchers, feel very strongly about, the government, the state of California, and the national government feel differently. And then there was the great bird, the bird that was protected by the national uh, government, the gnat catcher. Well, the gnat catcher, they were, they were concerned about preserving it. What we found after a number of studies, and they went on for several years, that the gnat catcher is alive and well, particularly in the state of Mexico in the country of Mexico, and there are literally tens of millions of gnat catcher birds there. So they're not a unusual item. You're right, Stan, capital is, is important, and, uh, and there's only so much capital when you have these type of uh, uh, delays. Let me just, if, if, if I may, share, right. share another uh, quick um, comment here with you, and that is the State of California Coastal Commission. I'm sure there's some, I know there are some of you out there that have had the pleasure to work with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they liked our waterfront coastal property. We had already transferred and conveyed 3,000 acres to a uh, coastal park, state park, but they wanted more. 
So they kept coming up with more and more issues. As we started our planning, which was many years ago, in fact, it took 28 years to process with the Coastal Commission, the, <clears throat> the uh, waterfront uh, property. We were planning to build two Tom Fazio-designed 18-hole golf courses overlooking the sea. The Coastal Commission said, well, you're going to have water runoff there, water runoff from that golf course into the sea. Okay, well, we'll deal with that. They said, well, we want you to go further than that. We want you to devise an engineering plan that no one has ever seen before. Well, we did that, and we built two cisterns, reservoirs, underneath the two fairways on the golf course. And that water is now retained and used, reused, for irrigation. It was a 10 to $12 million expense. Um, it was an interesting study and construction uh, process, and it did work. So we went to the Coastal Commission, we said we want our permit to build the new development, the new um, resort of Pelican Hill. Oh, but there's another problem. This is now 25 years into the process. They said the water runoff from the proposed resort There's no solution for it. And we want you to find a solution. We said, well, what is the problem? They said it's the warm-blooded animals, the sea animals, mating one quarter mile off the shore of our coast. We said, you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. They said, there's an answer to that. Perhaps you can pursue it. There are two and only two university professors in America that we trust that can work to solve that problem. Otherwise, the water runoff from the, from the resort, we believe, will contaminate the warm-blooded sea animal mating area. After two years of study, two years of study, we finally determined what it was. And interestingly enough, the water runoff wasn't from the golf course, the contamination wasn't from the golf course, it wasn't from the proposed resort, it was in fact the water runoff from the state highway owned by the state of California. It was the oil and water and, and, and solvents that ran off during the heavy rains, that ran off into the sea. And that's what was contaminating the sea. Well, the Coastal Commission gave us our permit, reluctantly, after 28 years, and guess what? The Coast Highway has never been improved. So, I share that with you. These are the type of stories that we've lived with for many, many years, and I wouldn't advise anyone to launch into that type of, a, of an environment. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. You're the only developer I know that has fond memories of dealing with agencies and the Coastal uh, Commission. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't uh, import the dat catcher into Orange County. So let's shift for a moment. We only have a few minutes left there. You want us to wrap up? I have a couple of questions uh, you know, real quick. You, you talked about location. And I, uh, I know you're not going to South Dakota, but uh, there have been several articles written about the company expanding into uh, new markets. And are you looking to expand out of Orange County? We have another 20, 20 years approximate of final development of the ranch, so we're, we're, we're engaged there. Um, and let me say, as far as uh, broader development, we're, we're, we're just focused on California. Our people, 
uh, our team understands California very well. Um, we, the company has been here 147 years. We understand it quite well. Our um, current team has had 50 years of expertise in underwriting um, property uh, in California, outside of Irvine, and within California, and we understand it well. I always say that we are provincial. I am provincial, the company is provincial, and we don't have a national focus. <clears throat> I believe there's enough here, California is large enough, there's enough here in California to, uh, to satisfy our, um, our corporate needs. Don, I, I have time for only one or two uh, questions here. People in the audience uh, frequently ask that you've guided this company fantastically. How would you describe your leadership style to this group here? Could you take a minute as part of the wrap up to give them some indication? Stan, I learned this early on in the Marine Corps. Spent three years there and I was educated in a different way. Their motto, which I never forgot, was mission first, then the team, then the self. It was about discipline and organization. And as far as management style, I look for this in our senior people who work at the company, and, and I believe that I'm included in this, and that is that individually you have to have curiosity, you have to be energetic, you have to be willing to focus for long periods of time, and you have to be uh, forward thinking, and have the ability to think outside of the ordinary box. And that's something that we do every day. And there's an important part of this, Dan, and that is we cannot predict, you and I can't predict, the future, but we can plan for it, and we do that. And at the Irvine Company, I believe we're good at that. Could you wrap up with telling us what you want the legacy of the Irvine Company to be? Well, um, do you want to talk about inspiration first, or do you want to go on to that? Well, you can wrap the two together. We, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Okay. Um, as far as the company is concerned, what I'd like to say here is that um, real estate in California is special. And the Irvine Ranch is special. I would like the Irvine Company to be remembered as a steward of the Irvine lands. As I said earlier, both lands that are built and lands that are unbuilt. In the lands that are unbuilt, the open space, I hope will provide freedom to all forever. Want to leave us with your thought on inspiration? Who do you most admire? Oh, Stan. <clears throat> you know, it goes way back. My, I, I'm, I'm inspired by many um, historic persons such as Marcus Vitruvius in, um, in the time of Christ, at the time of Christ. He was the, Marcus Vitruvius was an urban planner and architect. He was the first urban planner and architect and for the city of Rome. And he wrote 10 books. Those books I've read, and then along came 1,500 years later, came Andrea Palladio. And Andrea Palladio wrote four books about architecture and planning. And I believe he is the finest architect that's ever lived in modern times. He is uh, an inspiration uh, to me. 
Well, thank you for coming and sharing uh, with the Urban Land. Join me in thanking Mr. Donald Brown.